Welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. Why I'm Yakov Linger because other people listening to this podcast, there's other people sleeping in the room. Okay. So, well, okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Yakov Linger. I'm Naki Gordon. And we have a great episode. Do you ever do you ever wish that you could be somewhere else? Do you ever think <laughs> like, <right> like <laughs> <laughs> you ever think I, I live here, I live in America, I live in Israel, but like I, I wish I could see the other parts of the world. Like Saudi Arabia, like yeah. Iraq, or so, like something like that. Shlaimi Zions. Yeah, Shlomo Zions, who's he, risen to fame recently with his series with Peter Santanello on YouTube, um, delving into the Jewish communities and, and showing the outside world what that is, and it totaled over 10 million views. So Shlomo really has, has done a lot. He's also a contributing writer for Ami Magazine, foreign correspondent. correspondent. He's you so might, young you might, and he's yeah, done so much. You might have seen on Ami's cover, like, Turks in the White House and uh, Shlomo Zions in Saudi Arabia. And you're like, what is this guy doing in Saudi Arabia? Well, we delve so much into that, into this episode and see why he's going around the world where he's going what made him be like that plus so much more this is an episode that is awesome and different and highlights Shlomo Zions so enjoy oh, was I supposed to say something there you don't have to honestly I was spacing out All right. so enjoy the rest of the episode and enjoy welcome to the meaningful people podcast the podcast where we talk to people who are Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. We are here with Shlaimi or Shlaima. How do you say your name? Shlaimi. Shlaimi Zions. Yeah? Yeah. All the, all the way from... forty, all, all the way from 40 <laughs> countries. Yeah, all the way from a lot of places. But right now you live... Typically, you live in Israel. I live in Israel? It's a hard question. So I, I live in the moment. I oh. live in the moment. Okay. So like I'm just... Right now, I'm in the United States. I've been here since September, but... We've been in Israel for the past few years, and we hope to go back. You've uh, been here because of Corona and all of that. So we were under lockdown in Israel for like eight. I don't know from from March. I went into like voluntary early lockdown in March because I I I work in the news, mm -hmm. so I saw what was happening, and I was telling people for a long time like this could come to us, and everyone's like, "You're out of your mind. You're the crazy guy. Yeah, this has never happened. You're like you're a conspiracy theorist. You're a prepper." And then literally, hold on, I'm going to interrupt. My friend came over for Purim, uh, Purim night for, you know, after Megillah, came for a little, had a little to eat and obviously a lot of Divay Taira. And he was wearing a mask. And we were like, oh, he's so funny. He's so sticky. And seriously? Yeah. No, it was in the beginning. We all That's thought Purim, yeah, people, Purim. I thought people like you were like, okay, come on. Like, what are you fear mongering? Like, well, you've probably on? been to Wuhan. So I haven't been to Wuhan. <laughs> I haven't been to China. But one of the things Gosh. that you learn in travel is that anything that happens anywhere else could happen by you. So how do you learn that? Like, what's the what you obviously know something to say something like that. So like I just got back from Iraq hmm. and I visited a refugee camp where people like a whole city is living there now. But they used to live in, in their city, which is a couple of miles away. And they're all in tents and, and they don't have food to eat and there's no bathrooms. And as soon as you you see that with your own eyes, it becomes very real to you. You realize that like. I mean, we saw what happened in Washington last week. What's stopping things from getting out of hand and then a whole political system could fall apart? And I know it only happens in the Middle East or whatever, but it doesn't only have to happen there. It technically could happen anywhere. So travel gives you this idea that technically you're not actually as secure as you think you are. Scary. And that is a scary thought. Going back to coronavirus, I mm -hmm. was warning people like this could get very serious very quickly. Mm -hmm. I had one friend who was taking me seriously. And we were talking about like going to the groceries and buying food for months. And we both did it. Of course, toilet and paper. Then, and then when the toilet paper shortage was there, we were like the only people in the world <laughs> who had any because we first saw this whole thing. So from the beginning of March until September 1st, we were in Israel. We could like, there was a time on Pesach that you weren't allowed to leave your front door. Yeah. I don't think you in America ever had that. You um, literally were not, not allowed, allowed to that. Never. You were always able to go to like a supermarket and like stuff like that. At least Like essential, our, essential yeah, places? At least our park. Yeah. So it's not uh, my nature to be stuck Right. to one place and <laughs> after a bunch of months I said I told my wife like I'm, I'm really this is not good for my mental health we have to go out so we went to the United States and we're here ever since but but you're originally from oh born in Brooklyn States. New York okay we're in Brooklyn Bar Park okay grew up in Toronto Canada so my parents moved to Toronto when I was almost three and then when I was 16 I went to Yeshiva in Lakewood and then I got kicked out of Yeshiva in Lakewood and then I did it like a year on the street in Bar Park kind of thing and then I went to learn in Eretz Yisrael and then I got married and we lived there wow that was a, a lot probably happened in there wait you mentioned that you got kicked out of yeshiva you don't have to say what's yeshiva I'm not gonna say what yeshiva but like what I don't want you to but like what what 
were were you in the wrong? Was do you feel the yeshiva was not so, understanding? No, I was you? definitely in the wrong. You're no, definitely no, in the wrong. no question. I mean, the, I I didn't do anything too crazy, but I the first time I got kicked out of the dormitory was for not coming to Shacharis, and then I got kicked out for smoking in front of the dormitory and then I got kicked out again for not coming to Shacharis and then I got kicked out of yeshiva for having a phone but they let me back and then the first day that I got back they caught me again with the phone and that was out how come every one of our guests have been thrown out of yeshiva it's like a it's like a common know, theme maybe, maybe it's uh it brings them to a certain place <laughs> yeah in in life i don't know but so i don't take you as the type of guy who could sit still for for very long i could sit still for very long but i have to be doing something you have to be like on the way to iraq no, I just have to, <laughs> I can sit still. It's not a sitting problem, but mm -hmm. I have to always be doing exciting things. Do you think you getting thrown out of yeshiva played a big role in your life or? Absolutely, a huge role. In what, like how? What that because this is a theory of mine, you may agree, may not. But my, uh, the way I see Yiddishkeit right now is that a lot of, the, every, is that me? It is you. Okay, we're going to make that silence. We're going to okay. throw you out of here for the phone. No, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so the way I see Yiddishkeit is that everyone's in it. Some people are in it and they're looking out. And some people are in it all the way. They want to be in it. And before I got thrown out of yeshiva, I was, I was like doing all the moves, but I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. And then when I went to yeshiva a second time, it was more voluntarily than... At that point, I, I, I gave it a chance. I was there because I wanted to be there. So it changed the whole way I view everything. And you can't, it's not supposed to be something that's, it's not healthy if it's in, it's always, you feel forced. Mm. Right. So you want to be in a Yiddishkeit where you enjoy going to chakras in the morning, you enjoy Shabbos, you enjoy, Yiddishkeit doesn't have to be enjoyable, but as much as possible, you should make it enjoyable. It's all about marketing. Right? If we want hmm. our kids to, uh, to want to be Jewish, then we have to make it exciting for them as much as possible. Obviously, there are certain difficulties that are associated with Yiddishkeit and you're supposed to be much nefesh, but when you can make it enjoyable, by all means, do so. So I, I'm very curious about it, meaning you're, you have, have people listening, they don't see, they just hear it. You have very long payas, Um and you're, I, I don't, are you Hasidish? Are you Litvish? Are you Breslov? So I definitely consider myself Hasidish. I used to call myself Breslov, um, and I still am very close to Breslov. I go to Uman Frashan every year, and I learn Rav Nachman Swaram, and I do a lot of things that are associated with Breslov, but I don't like putting labels on myself anymore. So, cla no, no, isn't that classic? <laughs> I, I kind of saw that coming. What do you attribute the red sweater to? Like, that's what type of I, I always <laughs> like the color red, and finally, when I got the confidence to wear a red sweater, <laughs> my wife bought one for me, and I sort of became like a personal brand kind of thing. Were you, were you, I mean, now you seem like a very... Maybe you were always out of the box and like outgoing. Were you ever shy as a young person and like, and things shifted or you were always so this number of one? I'm still very shy. You are shy. I'm a very shy person. Really? Yeah. Did you? Nah. Did you? Did you? I kind of felt like you're really? shy. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. You I, don't strike me as shy. I mean, you, you literally interview people for a living and right. go places. But that's something I need to do. Like, I'm my nature is I'm very shy. If I walk into a room full of people, and I'm on my own. I'm gonna like try to find a little corner and hope no one notices me. And and yeah, I'm very shy. I have one friend who in Yeshiva in Lakewood. He sort of took me out of my shyness a little bit, so he helped me open up. But I'm still very shy. So many people like do know you. They maybe recognize you. And maybe thinking like that name. I recognize that name. So they know you. You have a a role with Ami Ami Magazine. What's that? What's that role? Uh, right now, I'm the senior foreign correspondent. So that means that if there's anybody who needs to go out of the country to do something, they call me. They call you and they say, Shlomi is uh, the other place that people might recognize you from. You just were involved in a a massive series on YouTube with this big YouTuber. His name is Peter Santanello. Right. Um, which the series accumulated millions and millions of views. His goal, I think, was to for him really get to know the Hasidic community to shed light on it. And you can say really, Hasidic. Like, <laughs> no, I, felt, I felt like I watched so many of those videos that I can't say Ch anymore. I'm just saying Hasidic. 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 It's so much easier. Even right. Peter does the Ch very well. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you, know, you ever say Chaverim? Uh, uh, yeah. I, don't, I, I didn't, but he probably like, but when, when non-Jews try to do it, they go like Chaverim. Like they emphasize He's that pretty one. good because he lived in Ukraine for a bunch of years. So yeah. The, okay, that's the okay. Yeah, they, they have so, that. So for people who don't know um, what the, who Peter Centinello is, what we're talking about right now. Could you take a minute to explain that? 
Sure. So Peter Santanello is a filmmaker, YouTube creator. Um, he travels the world to places that are misunderstood. And he tries to bring stories that the media won't cover. So like he'll go to Iran and, you know, all you're hearing from Iran is that people are that people are screaming death to America and whatever. And then he walks in the streets and says people are really friendly to Americans. And he's just trying to bring you that other side that you usually don't get to see. So I've been following him for a while because I do something similar and mm -hmm. I wanted to see what he's what he's up to. He posted a message on his Instagram stories saying that he's coming to New York City and he wants to have story ideas. If anyone has any ideas for him, they should let him know. So I sent him a message and I just said, you know, why don't you come see the Hasidic community? I didn't know that. I didn't know you're like such a, literally the force behind it. Yeah. It wasn't the force. It was, I just sent the DM. I yeah, like, but it was your idea. That's but so I cool. But I was sure he wasn't going to see it. Certainly right. he was going to respond. Nothing was going to happen. And then like, I don't know, a couple hours later, he said, uh, yeah, I, I really would love to do that. So we started talking on WhatsApp and here we are, 10 million views later. 10 million so views crazy. later. So and, and these videos, they range from him going to Williamsburg, Crown Heights, Muncie. Bar Park, Lakewood, he, Haverim, uh, Masameach, which is for sick kids. He, he spoke to, to a woman about shaitals and sneers and he went to, he attended a Shabbos Suda. I mean, all sorts of interesting things happened there. So people can go ahead and if you, if you guys are interested in watching that, you can search Peter Sentinel on YouTube and he has a whole long series. I don't know if it, was, if it was his most successful series. I mean, it's definitely classic me to say, oh, that was his most successful <laughs> one. But it seemed like so many people watched it and there were so many comments and and he got a lot of positive feedback. And, uh, as, you know, as Jews, from Jews, Orthodox Jews, I think, you know, we have a tremendous amount of Hakar Satov to him for, to really, you know, show what our community is all about. Right. Like you said, it's not really, you know, what the mainstream media is showing. So real props to him and you for, for facilitating that. Did you have any challenges while you were helping him navigate through through the community or what the video should be about? Or So I didn't really tell him what videos should be about. Uh, number one, there was a huge challenge of, of no one wanted to talk to him. Really? Really? Yeah. Everyone wanted to be anonymous. No, no one wanted to have anything to do with it. <laughs> really? It's for, like, we're all open. Like, the videos come like, oh, we're all open. No, and for you're weeks like, before, I right. was putting out messages on my WhatsApp status saying, like, I'm bringing a really big YouTuber to Brooklyn and I want people to talk to him. And is anyone willing to take him into their sukkah or whatever? And like, crickets. Really? Nobody. Hold on. Keep in mind, it was in, in, in everyone's defense. It was Corona-ish times. Yeah, but it was herd immunity in those yeah, Swedish sure, communities. That but that wasn't the issue. I just think they right, don't want to get show. on camera. Right. People just didn't want to be they on camera. They also didn't know before. Like, hindsight, like, okay, now we understand what he did and it's right. beautiful. Well, now I'm getting... But in the beginning, it's like, oh, is he going to interview me and like ask me to probably prove every, that Hashem exists? Like, I, I don't want to Every Jewish kidding. community and every every Balabas in the world is probably asking you to like bring, it, bring him and to And now my... I'm getting like 50 messages a day, like bring him here, bring him there. But then it was really very hard. No one wanted to have anything to do with it. So it how like, how do you power through that? So in Borough Park, I figured, you know, I can't find anyone else. I know Borough Park very well. I'll take him around Borough Park myself. Williamsburg, I didn't know anybody. But I put out a message and one guy actually answered, said, you know what, he can come to my house. And this is the Williamsburg episode, which was, I think, one of the most successful. He had this really cute Hasid al who barely spoke English, but he, but Peter really connected with him because he was genuine. And so that worked out well. And Crown Heights was the bomb. Sure <laughs> Crown Heights find is somebody. like... <laughs> That's easy. And it was like, I, I texted one of the only people I know in Crown Heights. And I said, can you do it? And he's like, I don't know. My daughter's getting married next week. We're going to the shoe store now to get shoes. But if we're back on time, then you can bring him. So, and it just worked out. That's great. And you mentioned your one. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned that it's your favorite one, but for my one of my favorite ones was he went to a Shabbos Suda in Pomona right. or in, in, in Muncie. And obviously was all halach, <laughs> it was halachically OK. They asked. Rob, he, he, he said on it like he, you said, it said like seven times, like we asked like so many yeah. rub on him. I asked so many. Yeah. Rubs. So he, you know, for context, he was yeah, yeah, sitting right. there. He basically filmed your Shabbos Suda, but you guys had have a Jew from family in, in Muncie, and you were there with with your family, and it was it was such a great video. First of all, the food looked incredible. It was, <laughs> but but he was he's never been by a Shabbos Suda before. Didn't and, know what, never heard of Shabbos before. Right, it felt a little wrong for me to watch it though. You know what I mean? But you, I'm not saying it was wrong, but you know what I mean, like. Because it was Shabbos, like I had that but eyesight. They, they, Again, I yeah. know, I know that you asked all the rubs and blah, blah, blah. No, I, got, I definitely got some flack for it. I know there are some people who are unhappy about it, but the Rabbanim I spoke to are very, very open-minded and people, and they also have like foresight. It's not, that video yeah. wasn't made for us. Right, right, right. Like the fact that a lot of Jews watched it is nice, but it wasn't made for our community. It was right. made for the outside world. 
And I believe the Rabbanim had this in mind when they gave me my psaq. And uh, amazing things are happening because of this video. Really? Are you talking yeah. about them? So literally, as I was sitting in the car. I oh, this a, is your Thursday night story? Not, this is not the Thursday night story. I'll share that in a second. But okay. right now, as I, was, as I was sitting in the car, when I parked downstairs, I get a message. He's looking through his phone to find the exact message. And, he and found it. No, listen he to this. Oh. Person. It's a voice note? No, it's a written message. It? Corey something says, Shloimi, thanks for helping Peter make the series about Hasidim. I'm from a Jewish womb, so that means his mother's Jewish, but was raised Catholic because of my father. At university, I was involved with Chabad Lubavitch, but always felt like an outsider because I was the only one not raised Jewish. I didn't learn much, but being able to watch Peter's series gave me more, gave me a more intimate viewpoint. Last Shabbos, I lit candles and said the blessing from memory for the first time in my life. I've also put a mezuzah up on my front door. Without you reaching out to Peter and without Peter's talented filmmaking, this never would have happened. Thank you both. That's wow. incredible. That's amazing. And it's I'm like, guessing that's what that's what you want to happen. Like that's the ripple effect from this type of series. This is what I want to happen, and this is what the Rabbanim saw when I came to them. So I understand people have flack. People people are upset. You know, you, mm -hmm. you can't just bring a, a camera into a Shabbos Suda. We went through it according to Allah. We figured out the best way to do it. This should, that it should even be done in the spirit of Shabbos as much as possible. And now we're seeing the results. I, I, I very much, I mean, he, you could tell he's like a very like sweet and, and just straightforward guy. It's curious. But in that video, he, he, um, he like, he went to davening and then like too many people were looking at him. So he's like, he left. He's like, I can't, like, I'm not here to disturb. And if I'm disturbing anyone, it was very, you know, he could have easily gotten away with it and just stayed and like, play dumb but he he's like no i don't want to disrupt the service he's a really good guy and he's really like in touch with reality like if, if something becomes uncomfortable for someone he's not going to go down that road he's very very special person w what's your you you meant you texted us thursday night that you're like i have a story i need to say it over okay so on thursday night i got another message from somebody who watched the series and this one 10 million views, only two messages? I can't believe no, there, there are, <laughs> yeah. I, I got thousands of messages. I can't even read them all. This one made me cry. Whoa. I might even cry again. We'll see. Is that what you asked for tissues? <laughs> <laughs> so this one goes like this. Um, this is sponsored by Kleenex. Okay. He's looking through his phone again. Trying to find that story. Dear Shlomi, I was first introduced to you through videos by Peter Santanello, to whom I am grateful for helping me see my own heritage through a fresh light. I'm age 62, spent most of my adult life stubbornly off the derech. But I only wish I had known more people with the kind of empathy, sensitivity, and kindness that I see in you. I grew up the son of a modern Orthodox rabbi, and unfortunately my exposure to God in Yiddishkeit was tainted with a sense of dictatorial obedience. I was often hit as a child and taught from a young age that any misfortune that befalls me is God's way of punishing me. Not surprisingly, I developed a hatred of God, or at least of the image I was fed about who God is. The hypocrisy I experienced from others and the lectures I received fraught with the do-as-I-save-and-not-as-I-do mentality only served to harden my heart through my adult life, and to this day, I struggle with my identity as a Jew. I was blessed with a devoted wife and a lovely child, but, the, but that 18-year marriage ended in divorce 14 years ago. I had everything a man could want, and due to my bitterness and anger, I let it slip through my hands, it's like I fell in love one day and woke up 18 years later with a knife in my back as my ex-wife conducted, concocted odious fabrications to maintain sole custody of our son and keep me out of his life. And you know what, Shlomi? Despite the false allegations and the legal problems I've encountered at her behest, I still have love in my heart and do not wish her ill. I suppose the point of this lengthy email is to admit that there's something major missing in my life. A sense of belonging. Not only in terms of love, which I'm sure I can find again, but in other ways as well. I fought so hard to break out of what I perceived as my restrictive yeshiva world, and I succeeded. But I'm reminded of the, of the famous phrase, be careful what you wish for. Watching your videos with Peter and having subscribed to your channel, I felt only love in my heart and a real sense of longing. The problem is, I don't know if there is such a thing as coming home again. I wouldn't even know where or how to begin, but I want to thank you for reminding me that observing, one, observing one's faith and genuine human kindness need not be exclusive of one another. These days I live my life responsibly with empathy for others as I try to do acts of charity and lift people's spirits. I'm grateful for my life, my health, my job, the love I had and the goodness that the people have shown me. I wish you and your loved ones long life, good health, parnasa and all you wish for. Sincerely, signed by that person. 
I read this email. I literally just broke down and cried. And there's a there's a Yiddish Neshama here writing. The, the 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 title of the email is "Is it possible to come home again?" Wow. So we have a Neshama who doesn't isn't sure if it's if it's too late to come home. Did you what? I, I'm, you don't have to like read out the response. I, I responded you right didn't away. Respond to, I, of course, I responded. You responded right up. I wrote hi. This person's name. I hope this message finds you well. Your email made me tear up, not only because of everything you've been through, but also because it saddens me that there are Jews out there who mistakenly think that it's too late to come home. You are a precious Hashem, a child of Hashem. You are my brother. I never met you. I don't know the extent of what you've been through, but I promise you, you can come home anytime. Hashem is waiting for you, and I'm here for you too. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. I gave my a couple of my phone numbers. And please do let me know what area you live in. I'd love to meet you personally. Come home. We're waiting for you. Best regards with love, Shlaimi. Wow. That's a, that's, it seems like that's a you side that you believe very strongly in. That there's, of course. nobody can't come home. Right. Even, you know, the, there's a famous, uh, I'm not sure where it's from, not a Yutam Chacham, but it says, it's somebody who says, Echtavash, somebody who says that I'm going to do an Avera now and I'll do Tshuva later, says, Ein must be you on the last there's, there's no possibility for that person to do Tshuva. I believe it's the Balatanya who says that the word must speak and you're, you're reading it wrong. It's in must speak and seeing there's no suffolk that even that person can come home and do tshuva. Mm. Beautiful. So, I mean, this is this is something that's central to Breslov, very much so in Chabad also, and Chassidus in general, and the Yiddish guys in general. Is that it's not, Of course, it's never too late to come home. Wow. Uh, speaking about home, I guess <laughs> you, you, I don't say you run away from home, but you, you run around to... A lot of countries. What's the exact number of countries you've been Just in? got back from my 40th. 40th. It's funny. I, I, have, I don't even know. How many countries are there in the world? 197. Wait, you knew that, Nachi? 197. Oh, come on. Oh, no my way you gosh. That. That's not a... That's like some, he, of course, knows that. He's it's like, like you learn that in like fourth grade. What? Yes. And, oh, come on. I'm kidding. And, and, <laughs> but okay. it's funny. You ever open... Countries. like you, you like pick up the, the Army magazine, look at the cover... And it's like has a bunch of going things going on. And you see like top bar, Shlomo Zions in Pakistan. It's like <laughs> what? What is this guy doing? Where is he going? I I, I want to delve into it. Like forty yeah. countries. A, what's your what's your favorite? Country? So many questions. There's all, there's so many questions. What's your favorite? What's the worst country? Where do you learn the most from? Uh, there's so, so much. Let's start with one. Favorite country you've been in? Okay. There's forty of them. You've been alive for twenty seven years. I know uh, his answer. We, uh, you know what his answer. He's gonna say Israel. Yeah, Websites yeah. for Israel. That's the that's the the answer I should give. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm gonna be very honest with you. I don't know. I don't know what my. Favorite. I mean, we we certainly have a very special connection to Israel. I lived there for a very long time, and there's no place like it. Mm-hmm. Having said that, and I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but living in Eretz Israel is not easy. It says that Eretz Israel nicknames be a serum. It's, right. Eretz Israel is is a place that it's. At least on a physical level, it's not not easy yeah. to be there as not, not as easy as here. Now with COVID, it's not easy to be here. But it's either. also a place that you you've lived. So I don't know if it could be included in one of those forty right. countries. These other thirty nine countries are like places you like pass through. Right? Pass through. That's, that's a good point. Right. But in in Eretz Israel is also a place we pass through. The whole world is, we're, <laughs> we're just passing through. I hear you. So nothing is permanent. At You're all. not going to get out of the the question though. So yeah, favorite country? <laughs> I love the Middle East. What can I tell you? Anything that. Any country in the Middle East, I'm crazy about. Have ha, how many? I don't know the answer to this. <laughs> Nachi knows probably. How many countries are there in the Middle East that you've been to? Have you been to like almost all of them? Well, I probably don't, not. I don't think I've been to one. almost all of them, but I've been to the heavy hitters. Uh, uh, probably most, yeah. So uh, could you tell? I saw like, on your YouTube channel, which is also I, I highly recommend people should go and subscribe. I, I recommend that too. It's it's it's, it's Shlomi Zion's your name, yeah. right? Yeah. It's popping. Um, it's great. It's great. Um, but I saw you went to, let, let's talk about Saudi Arabia a little. Yeah. So Saudi Arabia is a country that changed my life. I often say that it, there might, there's Shlomi's life pre-Saudi and post-Saudi. Okay. Really? Yeah. Okay. Tell us about that. Because number one, it was like, it's a country that nobody was ever able to go to. In modern history, it's been completely closed off. You could not get a visa for the life of yours. It was your idea to go there or was it yeah, absolutely my idea? Really? So, I love it. Like Ami calls him like, could you go to Gaza? Like, <laughs> we just want to see what happens. Could no, you just go to Gaza? No, but they're like, <laughs> No, Ami's like, oh, do you mind going to like uh, Mexico? And he's like, why don't I go to Saudi Arabia? He's funny because the first time they asked me to go somewhere was to go to Mexico. Really? I got okay. a text at like two in the morning from my editor, Mrs. Frankfurt, and she's like, uh, can you go to Mexico? I said, I guess. So I went to Mexico. <laughs> it's a long story, but people started writing letters into the magazine. They enjoyed the, the piece. And then so she said, okay, so for Sukkot, we want to do something special. 
So she said, I said, okay, I want to go to Saudi Arabia. Then we looked into it and it wasn't going to be possible because they don't give visas to anybody. So I went to Lebanon instead. And then a couple of months later, Saudi Arabia worked out. So so what happened to Saudi Arabia that you- Changed your life. Yeah. So basically, number one, I had, I'd say one of like the top three Shabbasim of my life in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, basically, I arrived there on a Thursday night and I was obviously alone. There's never alone, but I- in. In a physical sense, I was pretty. Well, you don't take your wife and get to Saudi Arabia. Are you I, crazy? I honestly <laughs> would have no problem doing it. She's not uh, ready yet, but I think I think one day we are gonna go together to Saudi Arabia. I do believe that's gonna happen. <laughs> Should I say I'm to that? Yeah, why not? <laughs> For sure. Spreading Yiddish. You're like a human kabbalah. Like you're like like you're like every one of them though. <laughs> There's like 500 of them packed into one person. That's Shlomi Zions. <laughs> so Saudi Arabia was was like this. I got there on a Thursday night. Uh, number one, alcohol is illegal in the entire kingdom. It's a, it's a Sharia law. Okay. One of the only countries in the world where alcohol, where alcohol is not allowed. So. Kiddush, like what am I going to do for Kiddush? So I was thinking, oh, I, I, uh, grape juice, so, no? So you can bring grape juice. The yeah. issue is that, I don't know if you know this, but if you talk to any chemist, you'd find out that if grape juice gets heated to a certain degree, even by accident, it could become alcoholic. Uh, so imagine like something uh, happens on the flight or whatever, and then so I land there like... and they <laughs> test it and it has alcohol, Shlomi goes to jail. It would have made <laughs> a, a great story, but I would have been in big trouble. So I said, no, we can't take grape juice. Um, I was my plan was that I was gonna buy grapes and squeeze my own, hmm. but that would have been very time consuming and messy. <laughs> so, in the end, and my backup plan was to make on matzah. Okay, is right? that, is that even, okay. you're allowed to make on on bread, yeah. But I ended up going to the supermarket and they have non-alcoholic Heinekens there. Oh, so wait, hold on. What what is that? What is that? It's, even? It tastes exactly like beer, it just has no alcohol in it. But I spoke to a Rav and he said because it's Khamar Medina, that like that's like Khashiv over there, so you can make Kiddush on it. Interesting. So that's what I ended up doing. But Shabbos, I was completely alone. So I, I was in my hotel room and I I thought like I'm a Saudi Arabia, it's really hot. So I'm gonna turn on the, the AC like the lowest it goes. And basically, like Friday night I'm already freezing. I can't do anything. I can't call room service to change. I'm stuck there. So I was wearing like Blankets and a talus and whatever I could find to keep put, myself put on warm. a turban. <laughs> you know, you're wearing your tefillin on Shabbos just to keep warm. <laughs> so <laughs> not tefillin, but I I took a selfie. What like before I made havdalah and I was wearing a talus and everyone's like trying to figure out like what <laughs> minig it is to wear havdalah. Like, wear talus by havdalah and it's just because I was freezing cold. But on Friday night, I like as soon as I lit candles, I like I got a little bit sad. I realized like I'm away from my family. There's no minion. I'm alone in a faraway country and the, it's Shabbos. I'm going to be here for the next 25 hours. And then a thought hit me. I realized that basically if you're in shul and there's 500 people in your shul, right? So like when you sing L'chadah, you're like, if you if you don't sing, does anyone notice? Right. Yeah, no one knows. Well, Yaakov, he has such <laughs> a beautiful voice. <laughs> no, so people yeah, would definitely sure. notice if you, if you were <laughs> No one would notice. No, they, they call me Yaakov Shwaki Jr. So it happens. Oh, okay. I have, Yaakov, a terrible, Yaakov, I have a terrible voice. Yaakov, answer our text messages. Come on, please. Yeah. You're going. <laughs> but when you are in Saudi Arabia and you're totally alone, you are making Shabbos for the entire country. Wow. Mm. So, so you, you, like you're saying you're the only like, person making Shabbos Like you in Saudi are Shabbos. Arabia? Like, like in Shemaim, if they're asking, like, how was Shabbos in Saudi Arabia? Like, there's a map of Shabbos in, and it's like, well, there's one red yeah, sweater like, in Saudi how, Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the red sweater. I was freezing. But <laughs> For those listening, Shalom is wearing a red sweater. Yeah. So that's when I realized that I have to make the Shabbos the greatest Shabbos ever. So awesome. So I, I literally, I like, I, I, I sang the Chodaydi and I danced around the room and then I, and then I, I made my Suda and I, I went through the bencher and I, any song I could find, I sang it. Even if I didn't know words, I made up, I made up a song. I made up tunes. It was, it was amazing. I literally stayed up to like four in the morning, and I was high. No alcohol, just high on Shabbos. It was crazy. Wow. That is such a night. I would have the worst Shabbos ever. That's incredible. And that, hold on. It's so funny. I thought you were going to say like, okay, you went to like the Chabad there. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. And the, yeah, you had is a great there, time. Is there a Chabad in Saudi Arabia? Not yet. Is there, so when you like, were you think you were, do you think you were the only from Jew making Shabbos in like, in Saudi Arabia? It's possible. I, I wouldn't know. Are there other from Jews there? It's possible there are in on some U.S. army bases or maybe in, ah. in an embassy or something. I don't know. If, no someone, way- if someone goes on to like, you know, Emirates or Delta, they can't book a trip to Saudi Arabia. Like, I think you posted on, on your YouTube, like, it, it, some countries you go to, it's like, don't go here, right? I'm not sure I said that. No, no did, you, oh, like you need a you, special visa. You need, so, no. Oh, so how we got into the country. Yeah, so basically, in, in the entire modern history, since the country was founded, there have been no outside tourists. 
it's very hard to get a business visa. Some people have done it. And if you're a Muslim, you can go to Mecca to for Hajj, which is like their Ali Ali Rega Ali mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, otherwise, you can't go. The kingdom is being modernized by the crown prince. So they started allowing- Women are driving- Women are driving, yeah. So they, they one of the things they did was they wanted to start allowing tourists in. So they made like a, a window from beginning of December 2018 till January 2018, so 30 days. Oh, sorry, January 2019. Mm-hmm. They gave you 30 days where you can go and uh, become, like get a tourist visa. A thousand people applied for visas. I was one of them. And I was there for five days. And you were in, I I don't remember his name. Um, you were in someone's house. That was the second time I went. Oh, that's okay. So who 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 is that? I don't even. So that guy, his name is Muhammad Saud. Um, mm-hmm. He is a Saudi Arabian young man. He's like 29, 30 years old. And he loves Jewish people and he loves Israel. He's on Twitter, right? He's, got, he's, he's on huge Twitter. on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, whatever. His, his, his first account got got uh, suspended. He started really? a second account and they didn't catch on yet. Wow. Is it like for the same reasons like alcohol is not allowed? So like No no no. Twitter is allowed in Saudi Arabia. So so why Twitter kicked them off. They're not the Saudis. Interesting. Yeah. So, it, thank you, Jack. Does he ever come to America? Maybe he'll come on our show. I I hope he'll come one day. I don't know. He was in Israel once. Wow. Yeah, so what's like what's so I yeah, so I think it was on your YouTube page you, you're meeting with him. Yeah. What's you know, where does his love for Judaism come from? Like what's that about? So I really don't know. It's it's a very surprising thing. Like there, are, I know a lot of Arabs, and a lot of them are quite fond of Jewish people. But he's like he's in love. He, this is a whole, whole nother level, and he he sings Jewish songs. I don't know if you've right. seen like yeah. He, he he listens to Jewish music, and he he's, it's very cute what he does, um, and it's also very powerful. Like I think he's influencing a lot of people in his country. He said what he told me was that when he was learning in university in the United States. He had he got sick. He has some health problems, and he was in the hospital. And he had a Jewish teacher who like helped him, brought him food, and whatever. So this person changed his whole perception on Jewish people, and uh, you know it's, it's crazy. You think about a little action you can yeah. do something for somebody who's not part of your community, someone just random out there. You don't know what kind of ripple effect that's going to have. It's crazy. We'll get right back to this episode with Schleimer Science, but first we're going to talk to you about AMR Farm. Rx.com. That's AMR Pharmacy, the pharmacy of the future, the best pharmacy in the world. Yaakov, you had COVID recently, and who was there at your side to help you out? My wife, <laughs> and she's the biggest fan of AMR Pharmacy. And she loves AMR. She loves AMR. Was by her side, yeah. AMR. Yeah. AMR Farm. They're, they're great. They're great. And I, I know people listening, they're, they're thinking, they're saying, guys, I get it. AMR is the best. Yeah. But are they the best? Yes, they're the best. That's how you do an ad, everyone. So <laughs> AMR Pharmacy, they're really, really great. They really care about you. They 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 obviously have all the new forms of medication, anything you really need, they're on top of it. And they're also always innovating. Yeah. So, so like we mentioned many times, these pill packs, I highly recommend it for those that could use it. Obviously, there's certain cases people's hands aren't as good, so bottles are better. But typically, people love it. It really segments their medications in the right way. So head to 848, no, well, you don't head Cell phone number, but you now you could eight four eight two 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 eleven ten, or you could go to their website. Nah, tell them the website amrfarmrx.com. Delivery pill packs, good meds, anything you need, they got it. So sign up with the best pharmacy in the world. And please. now back to our conversation with Schleimi Zionse. <laughs> See you. I want to delve into other countries and experiences that you've had. How about we go so. with like the worst experience? Yeah, okay, I like that. What's what's the worst? experience you had in a country please don't, say, please don't say five towns like it's just <laughs> not fair this might be my first time here i once took a for hair in five towns but <laughs> like Saudi Arabia, contrary yeah, to popular belief five towns, five towns is not a country uh, <laughs> so um okay so what what was your least favorite country um i don't think i have a least favorite country. okay okay the country probably has sharia and uh, can't say. no 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 no. so no. okay so so a, a country that you you've well, also i'll give you a, a city from. i didn't like okay. okay i didn't like new delhi india why? Neither did I. I was there with my wife a couple years huh. ago. I'm kidding. No, go You were not there? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Who goes to New Delhi? Well, some people go. I don't know. Yeah? It's, Is it how it looks in the movies where it's like a million people packed in a train station? You can't really move. I didn't go to train stations, but it's, a, it's like a billion people packed oh, yeah? into 
and it's it's it was dirty. It was maybe I saw the wrong parts of the city. I don't know, but okay. I I was not impressed. Our listeners in New Delhi are like, what the heck? Why is he? We get such a bad rap. You know, go on Yelp, give him a five star review in New Delhi. Uh, <laughs> I would I would love to go back. Maybe I'll find a better part of the city. I didn't like that. Like so, Bombay, India is a whole other story. Are, are, which which countries have you been in that the the from community? Uh, it feels like they're doing it really well. I'll, I'll give an example. Mm-hmm. I haven't. I'm not a world traveler, but I have traveled a bunch on my time when I went there. So I thought Gibraltar has a beautiful from community. Um, so it, it, I really like they're so close and they're right. so tapped into the mitzvahs and it's so small. It's like underrated, you say? Uh, I guess so. Whoever goes there has a great time. Like they are like these people are are brilliant and mm-hmm. the way they raise their children is so nice but that was my experience so maybe so i thought singapore was really nice community singapore is beautiful i heard no like yeah, you go to jail for littering there like is it hurt for chewing like a... gum yeah right chewing gum is a fine you're not allowed to chew you're not allowed to like bring it into the country it's... what's that about I mean, look at the streets of new york it's true it's not there a... you go you understand so, exactly what so it's what about. part of singapore did no the community you asked about the community yeah, yeah i'm saying which beautiful... part which part of their community that that first of all they're just to the rub over there of the communities, Chabad Rabbi. Uh, Shout out. I, I I have a name in my head. I don't want to say it because it might be wrong and then I will look like a fool. But <laughs> Take to the Google. Um, you think we'll find it? Is it Abergel? Chabad Rabbi. Uh, as Nahi looks, you'll you'll continue. So Yeah, so. Come on, Google's quick. He is a great chazan. Just just like the, the like really talented guy. Abergel, so, yeah. Okay, so I got it right. Nice. Shout Very out good. to Abergel. Good guy. Um, he's from Belgium, I think. Svartik, um, very talented chazan. The community is just really nice people. And there was this Shabbos Suda on Friday night and Shabbos day. And like after this, everyone just sits around and schmoozes. Um, there were visitors from all over the world, like South Africa, Taiwan. Um, there were people from China. This was like right before COVID. Anywhere you can think of, there were there were from people from there. It was very exciting, very inspiring. Um, Mumbai, India, also great, great community there. Chabad, that's the famous Chabad house. Mm-hmm. Um, wonderful Shabbos there. Bangkok, Thailand. Amazing people. Um, what other communities are nice? Lakewood is pretty. I heard like Lakewood <laughs> yeah. is. You just can't, you actually came from Lakewood. From, from <laughs> how many is there? Is like the single, let's say take Singapore. Like how many from Jews are in Singapore? I have no idea. How many Jews? You have no idea. Um, when we ask, we have a historian on. We'll ask them all the like what? facts. Factual. Historian, yeah. Yeah, he does, he's the traveler. He's the traveler guy. There's definitely a couple hundred um, there for business and whatever, but they're just very close, very nice, very nice community. Do you like traveling? Do you like being on, being on an airplane yes, for 15 ask. hours? I, I literally you love, love playing, being, being on a plane? Yeah. You like you love airplane airports? food? I eat airplane food, yeah. You eat air. Hold on. That's different. You eat, you tolerate airplane no, food. No, I, I, I mean, depends what's being served, but some, like, I've, I've literally eaten airplane meals. I've been like, wow, I, I wish I could get that off a plane. What's the, the craziest flight or or flying experience you've had so what a pretty crazy one going from guangzhou china to jfk Mm -hmm. 16 hours and 25 minutes and we saw the northern lights on the way whoa and i had to dive in like chakras like three times on the plane (laughs) well then hold on it's a bug out northern i went to iceland again say i traveled not your extent go go to china i haven't been yet really yeah beautiful place great place yeah i try seeing the northern lights expensive right the the country is expensive. Flying there isn't so much, and and Wow Air is out of business now. Wow, so. I went on Wow Air. So that you probably like a hundred bucks. It was it was very. Yeah, the countries are expensive. I went. Have you ever been to Pasay? I have been to Pasay. You so have? I, yeah. I was in Iceland. That's right, I was in Pasay. I was yoitza to see the Northern Lights, but I was yoitza. What's I? What's it like seeing the Northern Lights? Talking about like Hashem's creation. You have to make a bracha on that. One no? of the most beautiful yeah. sights. And you're on the plane. What what was that like? So basically, I was. It's. I was sitting on the right side of the plane. My friend who was traveling with me was sitting on the left side. And I don't sleep much on planes. Lately, I've gotten better at it, but in those days, I didn't. So I was looking out the window. I like to have a window seat always. And I was looking out the window, and I saw these things dancing in the sky. And I was like, this is just my mind. This, there's no way that's real. And then I, it's, I realized I'm not dreaming. There's, there's something happening outside. They're blue and green and pink. And then later, they like... So I right away I went to my friend on the other he was sleeping and I woke up and I said like you have to see this and he he couldn't see it so he had to come to my seat and he was he was blew his mind and like an hour later the pilot said oh yeah by the way you know we're just passing the northern lights but they were they were on the side of the plane for a few hours 
That's so wild. Dude. It's incredible. There, like most people, I mean, a lot of people listening to your podcast might even know, not even know what that is. Yeah. So what the, is that? Yeah. Explain. What I have not. no idea. It's, <laughs> the scientists say it's some kind of gas in the ear. Yeah. They and make these. It's like it looks like dancing like. What color? It was was it greenish or greenish, like Alaska? Bluish, and there was no? pink. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. It depends on the seasons. Alaska, yeah. You can see them sometimes from Canada. It really depends, but this is something. It's it's it, a it's the same way people have the hobby to surf. People have a hobby to chase the northern lights because it's yeah. it's very unpredictable, and and but to see it is is incredible. It looks magical. It's something you cannot describe it and it's there's must be something very spiritual there i don't know what's going right. on but it's, i'm sure yeah there's got to be somewhere in Svarm somewhere that talk about it i hear that it, it, let me ask you it, for someone listening they're from i don't know they're from brooklyn new york and they don't Flappish. really travel much <laughs> where where do you recommend that they they're from person and they want to go somewhere have a nice vacation or a nice experience uh, exploring where, where would you say they should go so right now i'm saying dubai Dubai, yeah. really? Absolutely. Oh, but it's, it's like hyped right now. Yeah, it's it's like uh, you know every like Pesach, there's Pesach for Yeah. So w- why why would you say Dubai? It's is the hype the, real? Like, is it beautiful? In is my it? opinion, the hype is real. I've been many times, and I'm going back. I've started giving private tours. I just like took some people to Dubai, and they had an amazing time. Um, it's one of the only places in the world where a yid can walk around and feel completely safe. Elaborate on that. More so, I, I guarantee you, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but you would probably feel the same way. I feel more secure walking the streets of Dubai looking like a Hasid al-Shayid than I would in Bar Park. What? Why? Yeah, why? Be, number one, because the rule of law is the rule of law. There's no punch a Jew in the face, no bail. You're out on the street in three hours like we have in New York City right now. Mm-hmm. Um, Shout out Mary de Blasio. We love you <laughs> not. I don't want to mention any names, but... Uh, it's okay, we will. <laughs> not we will. I, I'm it's, like, oh, no. it's like middle line, Switzerland over here. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's just, you don't you don't misbehave in Dubai. It's just not something you do. And the people there love Jewish people. They are, if, you, if you walk around as a... Like some people go like them, they take off their yarmulke or they wear a hat or something they want. They don't want to look too Jewish. You want to have the best experience, walk around looking as Jewish as you possibly can. People will invite you into their homes. They'll ask you to come out for tea with them. They'll want to show you their country. Really nice, genuinely good people. That's so, That's cool. so cool. Did yeah. you, Did you foresee yourself doing this for a living? and like, the, Or did you dream about being an accountant? <laughs> yeah, no, I, my, I have nightmares about being an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never first saw my... What can I say? This is always something I wanted to do. I, I didn't know like what I was going to do, but I knew that I was going to do something special. I knew that I was going to do something that required travel. It's just what my soul needs. Mm. Do you think, you know, let's take it back to the hotel room in, Sa- in Saudi Arabia for that Shabbos. Do you think there's, it's, it sounds like so amazing what you were able to experience. I feel like in, on a smaller level, you know, I was able to experience that during COVID, um, I made pace off with my wife. Like we, we couldn't yeah. be with any of our family. So it was just me and my wife. And, you know, everyone would think, oh, the Seder is going to be like two, three hours and they call it a day. But it was just like amazing. You know, it was so different and odd. So there you are in Saudi Arabia yourself and your shop. So you're up 4 a.m. singing and dancing. How can somebody who's not in Saudi Arabia in a hotel room tap into that, that holiness of Shabbos and, and feel just an ounce of what you felt there? It's a very good question. Um, it would take some thinking about it. But off the top of my head, Shabbos is not just something you can, it's not just like you can like get off the subway and, and you walk into Shabbos. You have to prepare for it. Mm-hmm. So a couple of things, tips you can do to prepare for Shabbos. Number one, get in the mikvah. <laughs> it's it's it, it on a on it doesn't make sense on a physical level, but something happens when you go under the water and you come back out. You're a new person. It's, it's Were you able to do that in Saudi Arabia? I was not. Oh. but if someone wants to take get that vibe, that energy on a regular Shabbos, try to go to the mikvah. Try to disconnect, not just when Shkia comes, but after Chatzos, put away your phone. Um, try some Shabbos food. Take out a safer. Have a glass of wine. Get into the get into the zone, you know. To prepare with your kids, learn the pressure with them. It's just about preparing. If if you show up to Shabbos like, boom, I'm here. You know, it's just get out of shul as fast as possible, eat the meal, and go to bed. But if you're 
you really tap into the energy of Shabbos, it's like it's healing. It's, so it's, you said that in Saudi Arabia that that Shabbos changed your life. There was one of the no, I said Saudi Arabia changed my life. One of the things, oh, okay. one of the amazing things that happened there was Shabbos. But once I got back from Saudi Arabia, first of all, I mean, what a misunderstood country. Yeah. Yeah. You you think of Saudi Arabia as the scariest place and there's just people getting beheaded all the time and whatever. I totally do, yeah. And then you go there and like everyone's just living their life, working, doing their thing. Why do you think it doesn't like why do you think the is it the media that portrays it poorly? Why like what's going on? So let's let's give the media fifty percent of the blame. Okay. And then you have September eleventh. Okay, yeah, that's pretty bad. Twenty hijackers were Saudi. Mm-hmm. So that's we have like we have this trauma we're, we're afraid of them right um then you put the the whole middle east israeli palestinian conflict whatever you want to call that into it and there we associate arabs with muslims and muslims with arabs and anyone who lives in the middle east anyone who's dark anyone we basically just make all these associations that really aren't i mean some of them are founded in truth but most of them are just stigmas what what's in it for us not to think like that nothing nothing uh, no, you can't be blamed for thinking like that. But do you feel like a certain like freedom now that you know truth? Do you feel differently? Of course, because I'm undoing all this trauma. So you you go around and you think, oh, Afghanistan, that's scary. Lebanon, whew, Spola, terrifying. Saudi Arabia, like Jew can't go there and come out alive. And then you do all these things. And you're like, the eh, world's not actually that scary. You're not. So you're not. You're not like sitting here suggesting people go to crazy places. But I think what you're saying is like. Don't just uh, assume. Don't just make assumptions because you know bad things have happened and carry around trauma for the rest of your life if it maybe isn't like that. So number one, what I'm saying is that you can live a much more relaxed life. You don't actually have that much to worry about. Um, You're reminding me that there's like a thing that, um, like as a child, like we all have that fear of like getting eaten by a piranha. <laughs> like you, I didn't know what a piranha no, was until okay, yeah, I, I was think that. that no, no, no. I it's it a only, thing. I think it was only you. Hold on. It's a thing that people Can are like, piranhas eat people. <laughs> and it's like the chance of most of us interacting with a piranha is so slim. It's in Finding but, Nemo. No, but like yeah. it's ingrained as, as a kid. Yeah, it is in fine. But like <laughs> you're ingrained as a kid. Like, okay, this is a scary thing. But like as you get older, you're like, it's not even, maybe it's a thing, but I don't even know if it's so going to I don't think it's a thing and I'll tell you why. Okay. I, I recently did some research on piranhas. <laughs> oh my gosh. And what <laughs> I learned, this conversation and what I learned is, and it could be wrong, but this is, you know, because I, I try to be very objective. This is a source I heard. I don't know if it's true. They say piranhas only eat things that are dead. Interesting. So, so the chance of you I get I know, it, I'm scared that I'm going to die. So basically, <laughs> then, if, a, if a piranha is eating you, you have bigger things to worry about than getting eaten by a piranha. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. It's so you Yako, know that your piranha from. fears could just get squashed <laughs> yeah. right but over see, here. I just squashed that one. But another thing, I we were talking about these assumptions, is that the Torah teaches us that you treat other people the way you want to be treated. So... We live in the United States. There are no shortage of assumptions about us. Mm-hmm. Jews have all the money. They control the banks. They control the media, right? You guys <laughs> have this podcast. And uh, <laughs> they have horns and they bring and they bring all the pandemics. So what I'm trying to do is say, listen, I, I don't want to be stigmatized. I don't want to be, I don't want you to put me in a box and say, Jews do this, Jews do that. Come meet me, see who I, see who I am, then make your assumptions. Then you'll make your decisions. So that's what I'm doing to other people. I'm treating them the way I want to be treated. I go to these countries and I see what's going on there. And then I come back and I tell my friends, you know, it wasn't really wasn't so scary. It wasn't scary at all. I would I, I would feel comfortable taking my family to Saudi Arabia. I would. If you if you had uh an hour with one person in history, who would you spend that hour with? So the question is we are in history. Oh. Yeah. What, like, what does that mean? Like we are like which at country? What point in history? What, no. Oh, so you say like, I thought it was like, like which point last hundred years, last oh, two hundred years, last from the, now from existence. From, from yeah. now t- till Adam. Wow. Um can I say three? Yeah. Yeah. It keeps it, it keeps it interesting. Yeah. They can't be alive. They, uh, they be, could be alive. Yeah? I don't know. I feel like they can't be. Well, whatever his answer. If they could be, then he'd meet them. <laughs> no, not true. <laughs> Some people want to meet the, the... This guy went to Saudi Arabia. I think he could meet... <laughs> <laughs> I, I would want to meet the Baal Shemta. Okay. What would, um, you, what would you talk to him about? Oh, I have a fourth one. What would I talk to him about? That's that's never going to happen. Are you worried so like you'd melt? Like you, you just see him. No, I, I probably... Yeah, I'd probably... Baal Shemta, would I melt? I don't know. Something I, I never thought of is is also like we always ask this question, but yeah. literally we don't know how to communicate with with 
with them like just from a like I, what, language was yeah like, no, i speak yeah that's sure i would communicate oh, okay never no mind. problem no problem there <laughs> i need to learn English. um what's Nachman, number I, if i started knocking i would just cry just like just getting to see him um the religious of Bradichev, because he had like if you wear Bradichev goggles you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. No. See, I have okay. no clue. What, Bredichev, what, goggles. So, so, what is that? So, Rebbe Bredichev, they called him Sonny Gurren Shal Yisrael. Basically means like Klai Yisrael's lawyer. He had a way of seeing everything, no matter what situation it was, in a positive way. So, for example, he once came to Shul, and in front of Shul, there was this guy who had a horse and buggy, and the guy was was oiling the wheels of the, the carriage in his talus and tefillin. So, like, any Rav would be like, what in the world are you doing? You're wearing a talus and tefillin. And he just said, Rebbe Shalom, even when they're wheeling the their the wheels of their carriage, they're davening also. Mm. He saw it the other way. So he mm. was wearing the Bardich of goggles. Mm. So if you can wear those, I mean, the world's just a happy place. There's no, there is no evil. And then the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I don't think uh, anybody has such had such a big impact on me as as Lubavitcher Rebbe. Like the the things he did for Klal Yisrael, the, the vision he had for Klal Yisrael, and the fact that I can travel to almost any country in the world and have a mikvah, have a place to be for Shabbos, kosher food. Tzitzis mezuzah, chas v'shalom, if someone, you know, if someone needs to be buried, Chabad is there for them. No one else is doing this. Well, well, maybe some other people are doing it, not on that level. Nach, you want to hit him up with uh, the mitzvah question? Is there a, is a specific mitzvah, maybe the 613 of them, that maybe stands out to you or, or you connect with more than any other? Absolutely. Okay, let's hear it. Um, mm. I, I just love everybody. That's that's pretty easy. It is it so on that note, the other way, what's what's something that you as, aside for people judging, because I think we spoke about that, what's something that you hate when Claudius Roll does? Claudius Roll does everything well. I don't Oh, you're in the goggles. No pet peeves? What? No pet peeves. I think uh we should behave better on airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I'm gonna say. I think uh, whoever needs to to understand that will understand that. What is the worst advice that you've ever gotten? Don't follow your dreams. Someone gave you that advice? Yeah, people are like, yeah, it's not practical. You're never, it's never going to happen for you. Do no, get a job, advice. become an accountant, whatever. On the flip side, what's the best advice someone has given you? I've gotten a lot of good advice. Um, the best advice. He's thinking. I have to think about that one. Is there any other question you can ask while I think about that? Uh, sure. Um, what is the most toive advice? That oh, you- <laughs> oh, I, well, oh, oh, you got one? Okay, yeah. I was joking. But, okay, that there you go. Yeah. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Oh, okay. Just That's make sure good. your wife is happy. How long are you married for? Uh, soon six years. Oh, wow. Very nice. What is one thing that you wish you had known when you began your career? Did you just Google like questions to ask? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I still think I'm in the beginning of my career. Um, one thing I wish I'd known. Pack lightly? No, I don't pack so lightly. <laughs> you need sometimes you need stuff. I mean it's important to pack lightly, but there's certain things you can't get in other places. Like if you're if you're a if you're a tremor tire mitzvah, you can't always pack lightly. So if someone who has no no kosher, no feeling, whatever, sure, go ahead, pack lightly. Um, something I wish I'd known in the beginning. I I didn't think we'd get this crazy. No, no. You kind of created a role. Like you can't. Yeah, you yeah, can't, created. This you couldn't have grown up thinking I was going to be the foreign correspondent for like because you created this role. Yeah, no one's done it before, but it's like we didn't even speak. How do you even get first first started? Like your first gig with Ami. You reached out to them. They reached out um, to me. So basically, to make a long story short. Turks, you know Turks? Yeah. yeah. So he... Jake Turks. Jake right? Turks. He got me... I, I met him and I told him I wanted to start writing and he got me in touch with Ami and he made it happen. Really? Mm. Yeah. So yeah. he he's the reason why you ended up in 40 countries, I guess. I was traveling before I went. Oh, were you? This traveling thing was something I do always because I'm, I'm just a curious person. But certainly being on the Ami team has enabled me to go to places I probably wouldn't have visited without without them. What so when you go to these places, you speak to a lot of people there and interview a few people. Um, what's what's something that you've picked up from talking to these people, or maybe even an interview style or how you do it? Is there is there a secret to it? Is there a way that you specifically like doing it? 
I don't think there's any style that I follow. It's just like I'm genuinely interested in people. So I want to connect with people whenever, however, as much as possible. And I have a very diverse spectrum of, of people who, who I call my friends. Um, and when I interview somebody, usually we go so deep that like we build a connection. It's not just like I, I interview someone and then I walk away. We never see each other again. I'm in touch with people I interviewed four years ago. Um, like often. Mm. I just, I don't know. I just like people. I just want to get to know them as as. Is there a specific possible. person that you've interviewed or connected with that uh, means a little more than the rest that you so, could say? So, well, so I think they all mean a lot to me, but some have have made a bigger impact on me than others. Like who? Shout out time. So first the Rabbi Yitzhi Horowitz in, uh, in California. He has ALS. Mm -hmm. That was a powerful one. So could you explain the, the meaning? Cause he, he's not capable of speaking with his mouth he's not capable or of moving, going anywhere. Yeah. So, so, so how could you build that connection? So, so unfortunately, I'm not I'm not really in touch with him anymore, and this is very simple. It's because he can he communicates through his eyes. There's a special machine that mm -hmm. can basically read a person's eye movements, and they can spell out letters. But it takes a long time to write sentences and paragraphs. Takes much longer and whatever. So and he writes like weekly divertira, yeah, many pages. It's very painful and stressful for him to do so. But the when I went there, I was there for a bunch of hours one afternoon, and the message he shared is like every single person, no matter who they are, what the what situation they're in, they can be bedridden, can't move and can't speak. They have a very special mission that only they can do and no one else can do. And and they have to be there. And he's 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 a happy man. Really? Yeah. If you were if you were in my shoes right now, is there something that you would ask you that we haven't? Um When are you going to open a Gemara? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope on one of this those 16-hour flights. This isn't a fire. <laughs> um, okay, so you you said, I like that question. Uh, you said, you say, oh, is there a someone else that or others? So there's you... also a, a Chabad Shliach in, in Mumbai, India, who took over for Rabbi Gabriel and Rifki Holtzberg, Hashem Yom Kandamam. This this man is very special. I mean, I don't think most people most people think of about a chabad shliach in the sense that like, yeah, that's where I'm going to eat challenge when I when I go on vacation. They right. don't understand what it means to build something from scratch, to to go to a place where you have no friends, you have no family, you're alone. There's no when when something in your community goes wrong, there's no one to turn to. You turn to yourself, to mm. Hashem, and most shluchim don't let you win so deep to let you know like how how difficult things are sometimes he did um built a very very special relationship with him and i just wrote this all these three, three things that i'm telling you right now i recently wrote nami magazine but there was one more person who made a very big impact on me his name is rabbi yeshayahu haber he had an organization in israel called matnat chayim which means gift of life and basically they used to get kidneys for people who who are on dialysis and he himself was a kidney donor, and that's why he started the organization. And he, sorry, he was a kidney recipient. And I interviewed him, and he was he, he had a whole problem where the, the Israeli police made an investigation into his organization because someone had said that he was selling kidneys. So, and there was prioritization of who the kidneys were going to, whatever. So they did this whole organization, and the whole investigation. Turns out that he was completely guilt free, and he was set off. He was let off the hook, and no problems. Um, what I did this interview with him right after he'd been notified that he was free and there were no problems. And I was very moved by his story and by what he was doing. And I told him, you know, I, I would consider donating a kidney. Really? It's something I would consider. I have to think about it more. Like, and I'm, I'm still thinking about it. It's not, it's not something to take lightly. It's like, there, there are a lot of ways that it can change your life. In, in positive ways and there's obviously I, I don't I'm not an expert on the subject but but these things can be risky as well I understand you know you it's, <clears> it's <throat> most people don't just voluntarily walk and voluntarily walk into a big surgery like that so I'm thinking about it but anyway um this interview never got printed in Ami for whatever reason the interview did not get printed and usually after I print uh, after I do an interview with somebody and the interview doesn't get printed people start calling me like hey what's happening with my article when's it going so a couple of months after the interview, he called me and he said, uh, you know, I, I was sure like he was going to ask me, you know, where's my article? And he, all he said was, Shlemy, where's, where's the kidney? 
Wow. <laughs> he didn't care about the right. like the exposure for the organization. It would have been huge for him. Like, he, all he wanted to do was help another yid. And unfortunately, he passed away from COVID. Like, right. And my wife went with me to that interview. She was taking pictures um, for the magazine. And when I told her, she was like, wow, what a special person. Like, And for my wife to say that, that's like, it's a big <laughs> compliment. Wow. Wow. Um, Shlomi, there's, as we wrap up, there's a lot of people listening and uh, you're definitely on the younger side of uh, people we've gotten to speak to and get to know better. Young, but, youngest? Uh, no, I think Pesach. Is he? 20, is, 20, is 26. Younger. But um, is is there a message that you want our listeners to, to hear? I mean, obviously we spoke about a lot of messages, but just closing off on one centralized message for everyone listening mm, centralized nice word Yakov. Yeah, it's real world. we're on centralizing <laughs> yeah <laughs> Nahi likes to question my words um, he's wearing word, like a, a bunny rabbit on his shirt <laughs> my rabbit good for you rabbit. oh is that your rabbit I have a pet rabbit yeah I know you have a pet rabbit uh, <laughs> but is that the rabbit or is just yeah. a rabbit yeah Remy go to Remy, sleep this right? is a sweatshirt um, it's actually my wife's sweatshirt but it's 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 for Yakov usually wears his wife's women. clothing I don't know how, how are we talking about my pet rabbit when I asked him yeah I have a pet centralized rabbit centralized message um there are so many messages, but um, I would say number one, try to be happy. And happiness is very important. And when you're when you're when you're happy, when you're in a good zone, it's called moichin degalus. I can see this. You you attract good things into your life. It's like a frequency. It's like when you're when you're, it's like basically you can, if you're unhappy, you're talking on a different channel. To you're ta- you're talking to negative vibes. When you're when you're when you're happy, you're you're like bringing real good stuff into your life. So track of Vizanga, right? What track of Vizanga? Yeah, tra- it's all it's all connected to the same aspect. It's like that when you're in a good place, mentally, good things happen, and it, Hashem wants you to be in a good place. Um, what else can I say? Follow your heart as long as it doesn't take you to bad places, and um, you can do this. I think it's such an important message what you just said because like. You've been to so many places around the world and if you're and what I think I took from this is this, is if you're good in here and you're good in here in your mind and your heart it doesn't matter where you are you could be in Saudi Arabia where mm. it's you know, the Jews that people think are hated and it's the Middle East and you could be in Lebanon but if you yourself you know like a Mishkan if you're good then everything's good but as somebody who's traveled to many many countries and mm-hmm. i'm not even close to finished Bezer Sashem, i hope to maybe Amen. visit every country in the world one day Amen. it's 197 um, 197 <laughs> we'll see if we it wasn't my goal originally but now i'm starting to think about it because it, i realized that 40 it wasn't actually so hard how so. are you gonna do north korea okay we'll, we'll figure it out just go worry. to the just put a toe in and right so anyway Don't um there. if we uh, one thing i realized that as somebody who's traveled all over the world and spent a lot of time with many different people and seen all sorts of things what we have as Klal Yisrael, nobody else has, and you can you can you can go out to get to get some fresh air to to you know to to change your mindset a little bit to to you know if you're curious you need a break but it's here it's mm-hmm. all here it, we're, don't run away everything that anyone has is here it's it's literally the best place in the world to be and if you've gone you can come back yeah and it's never mm. too late to come back of course. Shlaimi, thank you for sitting down with us. Thank you for sitting down with me. We'll see you in North Korea. <laughs> oh, man, I feel like I'm in Saudi Arabia right now. Did you now. just like eat like a full like Shabbos meal? And you're like, <laughs> oh, that was delicious. <laughs> no, I, I, just, I just traveled around the world. Ooh, okay, so I'm that. jet lag. So that's the jet I'm lag just sound? Jet, that's a jet lag sound. You, you know, know you know what's very interesting that, that Shlaimi pointed out to us after the interview? What's that? I was wearing a sweatshirt. Do you remember you when he said this? You were. I was wearing a sweatshirt. What was on my sweatshirt? Penguin? Do you remember? You say a penguin? Yeah, no. No. We, by the way, everyone could know we do these like months in advance. <laughs> I was wearing a sweatshirt with a rabbit. Okay. You don't remember oh, this? Oh, his name Zion's in Hebrew means rabbit. Yeah. It's I, so random. Is it Hebrew? Whatever language it is. Polish? Yeah. Whatever the language <laughs> that is. Zion's is not Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, it was, it was just, like very ironic. Like I just... It was just so funny. I'm so happy we mentioned that. I I'm thought, so- unless I had to mention that. I, I, when do I ever wear a sweatshirt with a rabbit on it? Right. For all those who who didn't know who Shlomi is, or maybe you, you did know because you read his stuff in Ami. If you didn't know him, now you're going to start reading his stuff in Ami. Also, go to YouTube and type in Shlomi Zions. You'll see some amazing stuff. He has an awesome channel with videos all over the world. He has some crazy experiences. I saw one of his videos where he was next to an air marshal on a plane. And he saw the guy's gun and it was like a serious situation. He didn't know he was an air marshal. Anyways, guys, go ahead and check him you out. say like spoiler alert. Like now you just gave Spoiler away alert. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so check out all the rest of his stuff. And, and yeah, he's, he's definitely 
uh, so young but but so accomplished, and and I really can't wait till see what else he has in store. He's always planning, and like I I, I see he he always has ideas, and he's. He's he's gonna change the world if what, he hasn't already. What are his ideas, Jakob? What's on his mind? Like you, you always see he has ideas. How do you see someone's ideas? His WhatsApp status. Okay, that works. <laughs> All right, guys. See ya. Ciao. Cult of. Cult of. Ooh, I like that.